Well, let's turn together in God's Word to uh, Romans 3, and we'll be looking together at verses 21 through 26 this morning. Romans 3, verse 21 through 26, where God's Word reads as follows. But now the righteousness of God has been mani manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. It was to show His righteousness at the present time so that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So far, the reading from God's Word this morning, may He add His blessing to our hearts. Well, we have looked at several of this paragraph of Scripture, and now the idea this morning is to look at the whole of it. So we've looked at uh, different parts at the beginning, seeing man's righteousness being a derived righteousness, Righteousness, a righteousness that comes from the righteousness of God. We have seen that the righteousness of God is what is applied to man to remove his sin, uh, removed through Christ, through faith in Christ. And now we want to look at this very, uh, very important section of Scripture, a, a part that, that you could spend a lot more time on, this this section here in Romans 3, we want to see the, the message of the whole paragraph. How does the whole connect the smaller parts? And in some sense, what we will see is a, is a study of opposites. The righteousness of God compared with the un of man. man. Man does everything wrongly, unrighteously. God does everything in righteousness. And we're going to look together at, at that in, in different ways here this morning. And what we see in this text is that God's righteousness imputed to man, so, so counted to man's account, is shown as valid in his justice executed on Christ. So, so it's going to be talking about the righteousness of God throughout this paragraph. We're going to see the righteousness of God also as it pertains to his his distribution or his application of justice. God is righteous in all that he does, also in his justice, and his justice must be right so that we can be justified. So we're going to see God's work of redemption in Christ serving as not only just, it is not only righteous in and of itself, but that righteous justice also makes it possible for God to justify. And those are the two parts that we're going to look at here in this text. We're going to first see God as just and next see God as justifier. So God's righteousness imputed to man or credit account is shown in his justice executed on Christ. So let's begin by looking at God as just. The idea, uh, well, the first thing that we want to do is we want to connect the idea of righteousness to justice. Because the idea of righteousness is obviously important in this text. We, we're, we have before us uh, six verses, and in those six verses, four times the Apostle Paul is going to refer to this righteousness of God. You can see it in verse 21, the righteousness of God has been manifested. You see it in verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith. You see it in verse 25, where it talks about God's righteousness being demonstrated, being shown. And that idea is repeated in verse 26 when it talks about his righteousness being shown again. Again, all of those being mentions of the righteousness of God. And that righteousness of God, we have seen from our text, is received by man through faith. And those are uh, the, the, the issues of righteousness that are primarily under consideration in verse 21. And 22, when it talks about the righteousness of God being applied through faith in Jesus Christ for belief. And so you have this contrast, this, 
this description of the righteousness of God contrasted with what was before. Now, it seems like we've been in, in Romans 3, verse 21 for some time, and that is true. Uh, but before that, we were in Romans 3, verse 9 through 20 for some time, which is also true, which describes the unrighteousness of man. So, so now we're spending a long time talking about the righteousness of God before we were spending a lot of time talking about the unrighteousness of man, how man is corrupt in everything. He, it says in verse 10, none is righteous. Verse 11, no one understands, no one seeks for him. Verse 12, everybody's turned aside. Everybody's worthless. No one does good, not even one. In other words, there is not a single shred of righteousness in man at all. And by contrast to that, you have this fourfold description of the righteousness of God. So unrighteousness of man compared to the righteousness of God. And the righteousness of God is also applied to his judgment. So if you look in verse 26, it talks in our text about God's righteousness being shown so that he would be seen as just. So there is the righteousness of God, which also pertains to his application of justice in all that he does in governing his creation. So, so the righteousness of God seen in the way that he deals with the unrighteousness of man. That's what's going on in, in chapter 3. Man is justified. Man is declared righteous by God as a gift. In, in verses uh, 23 and, and following, uh, 24 and following rather, it talks about all these things that God has done to show his righteousness in judgment. You have the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption, the purchasing of the, per, uh, of the, of the, of the sinner enslaved, uh, paying the price for, for their freedom that they would no longer be enslaved to sin. Uh, the propitiation of Christ by his blood, meaning the wrath of God being poured out on Christ, all of that being uh, implemented, being carried out for two reasons, it says in our text. Uh, first, in verse 25, it says, these things, this redemption and propitiation, was to show God's righteousness because he had passed over former sins. And in verse 26, it says that this, this redemption and this propitiation was to show his righteousness at the present time. So, so there's two places where we recognize God's justice in his judgments, both in the past and the things that he had done and also in the present. So think about this statement about God having passed over former sins as it's recorded in verse 25. That, that description of God and him passing over former sins deals with the, 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 the history of Scripture. Uh, when, you, when you use that kind of a past tense, he had passed over, he did something in the past, you're dealing with the rearview mirror. You're dealing with something that you have, you have gone beyond already. This is something of, of history, something that has already been done. And so when it's speaking in verse 25 of these sins that God had passed over, he is talking about those sins of the past, the sins of the people of the Old Testament, the sins of the patriarchs, the sins of Israel. Uh, they had been given much. They had, they had God's law written on tablets of stone. They were aware of the commandments in the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, and yet they transgressed. They, they transgressed against God, and yet God did not judge. Not totally. He, he did judge, but, but not totally. Israel's transgression begins almost immediately after God gives his instruction. So on the shore of the Red Sea, after God leads Israel out with a mighty hand, with these ten plagues, right after, as they're on the shore of the Red Sea, Israel there already begins disputing with Moses, complaining that they want to return to Egypt. Now, what is that? That's a, a profound demonstration of a lack of faith 
and a lack of gratitude. There's a lack of faith and a lack of gratitude almost immediately among the people of Israel, and yet when they get to the other side, in Moses' song in Exodus 15, he says, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This sinful people singing of the salvation that they have in God. God had passed over those former sins. This sinful people able to sing of the salvation of God. 20 times in the book of Psalms, you have the psalmist describing uh, the salvation that belongs to them. Uh, for example, in, in uh, Psalm 18 and, and verse 12, you, you have one of these examples where, where David, the psalmist in that, in that sense, is singing of the salvation that belongs to him. The Lord is my rock, says David, and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation. This is a man who sinned greatly against God. This is a man who, who had one of his most loyal ser uh, servants murdered so that he could have his wife. This is a man who, who in his pride, numbered... The, soul, uh, the, 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 the might and power of Israel, and because of his pride, 70,000 Israelites died. And yet he sings of God as his salvation. How can those realities be reconciled? Did, did God just ignore Israel's sins? Because, well, there is special people. There is, there is special people, so I don't deal with Israel's sin. Well, that would not be righteousness, would it be? That, that would be injustice. How is it that, that God had passed over former sins? Because God himself in, in Deuteronomy 27, verse 19, sets a very high standard for the application of justice among the people of Israel. He says there, Cursed be anyone who perverts the justice due to the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. And yet, here it's talking about these former sins that, that God had passed over. These sins of Israel, which, which were committed, nobody's disputing that they were committed, but they were not resolved by the time those patriarchs died. By the time the people of Israel died, the, the sins they had committed had not been atoned for. And they lived in a time in redemptive history where it was actually impossible for the final atonement for their sin to have been accomplished. Because they lived in the time when their resolve or the, the instructions from God to resolve their sins was to offer burnt offerings and sin offerings and, and peace offerings to, to burn these, kill these animals and burn them before the Lord. These bulls and goats which were slaughtered for the sins of the people of Israel. And yet, their repetition and God's word shows that there was never any confidence of salvation coming through those burnt and slaughtered animals in any final sense at all. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 11, the New Testament interpreting the Old Testament says, every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. So God had passed over these sins of the people of Israel. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, is, is he unjust in doing that? The scripture plainly teaches that Christ is the only one who can take away man's guilt. And yet Christ had not appeared yet. He had not offered himself as a propitiation by his blood yet. He had accomplished no redemption yet. But we have all these different testimonies from the Old Testament saints that, that they have confidence that God is the God of their salvation. The, the Old Testament saints have assurance that they are forgiven. So the question for us is, 
Has God not perverted justice by not punishing the sins of the Old Testament saints? Can God pass over those sins and still be just? And the answer is yes. And the answer is given in this text because the answer given for the sins of the past is not any different than the sins of the present. The justice of God in passing over the sins of Israel is in the redemption that is in Christ Jesus and the propitiation by His blood. It says so in verse 25. The redemption of Christ and the propitiation of, of His blood was to show God's righteousness in passing over these former sins. See, God is not a perverter of justice. When it talks about in our text that God passed over former sins, what does it really say in connection to the redemption that is in Christ and the propitiation that is from His blood? It's saying that God passed over those sins temporarily. That that, that was an accounting that was coming in Christ. That the righteousness of God in judgment can be seen in the sins of the past and that He didn't really ultimately pass over them. He passed over them for the time until Christ came. And then when Christ came, he was the redemption, the propitiation for the sins of the people of Israel. So that's why it says in our text, uh, in verse 25, that God has this divine forbearance. Forbearance is uh, another way of expressing patience, uh, awaiting God exercises a forbearance in the sins of the past, waiting for Christ to come, waiting for, for Christ to do that work of redemption and propitiation to satisfy divine justice in him for the sins of the past, for the sins of the people of Israel. Christ's propitiation then shows, demonstrates, proves even that God is just in his dealing with the sins of the past. God is just. It also says in our text that, that God is just in showing his righteousness at the present time. So God shows his righteousness in Christ's satisfaction for the sins of the past, but Christ's work of redemption, his work of propitiation, is expressed in a moment of history so that today in the present we can see his justice as well. So for Israel, they were looking ahead to this time when, there, when, the, when justice would be satisfied, that, that they could sing with confidence about this God who is their salvation, is, in the present tense, their salvation. And then now we have the, the privilege and the joy of a, a greater manifestation of this progressive revelation of God where he makes his plan of redemption clearer and clearer as time goes on, we live in this moment where we, where we have this present reality, where there's no doubt of what Christ has done. There's no doubt that, that he did redeem his people. There is no doubt that the wrath of God was poured out on him at that moment on the cross. You see, the promises that are made in the Old Testament, of which the, the, the Old Testament saints are so confident that they're singing about their salvation, those, those promises made find their focus and fulfillment in Christ. What people look forward to from Genesis 3.15 on is that moment in history when Christ redeemed, when, when Christ was the propitiation of the sins of his people. The promise of the past has become a present reality. We don't live in a time where we anticipate what God will do in Christ for redemption. In terms of his return, yes, we do. But, but we, we live in this time where we live uh, understanding that the promises of the past are fulfilled in Christ. God is righteous, God is just, and his justice has been satisfied in Christ. There is no debt for sin that is left unaddressed, unpaid, whether in the past or present today, or in the future. Christ has done his work of redemption. Christ has been the propitiation. He has shed his blood for that end. And so the righteous 
promises that have been made by God as He establishes the covenant of grace right after the fall, right in Genesis 3, they have been fully realized in Christ. All of that progress from Old Testament, from the, the coming of the seed of the woman, very vague, to the setting apart of Abraham and his family for that specific end where he will be a blessing to all nations, showing this, 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 this specific mediator, redeemer, coming through Abraham's family. The holiness and the righteousness described of God in his law. The, the king assigned from the line of David to be a perfect, eternal king on the throne of David forever. And then this, this future promise in Jeremiah of this reality that God will magnify and internalize in, in ways heightened from the times of the Old Covenant, Old Covenant, Old Testament to today. All of these things finding their fulfillment in Christ. God's justice has been established. In the covenant of grace, God establishes preservation by Christ. His righteousness promised to be applied to those who believe. His sacrifice, perfect, to do what the bulls and goats could never do, according to Hebrews 10. All of the punishment for the sins of His people God laid on His Son. And all of that, verse 24 and 25, prove that God is just. That God is just in dealing with the sins of those unrighteous people, none of whom seek after Him, none of whom praise Him, none of whom worship Him, all of those living in darkness. Man's sin isn't passed over or ignored. But the consequence for man's sin is laid on Christ, who bears the wrath of the Father. The righteousness that man lacks is graciously given to him by God in Christ, through which man is justified, declared righteous, pardoned of his sin. He is redeemed by that word. You see, my friends, the justice of God is never halfway. God is never almost just. He's, he doesn't neglect justice at all. To do that would make Him not God. God is righteous and good in all that He does, also in His practice of justice. He demonstrates this righteousness in the work of the Son who offers Himself as a substitute. But there is more in this text than just establishing God's justice. It also talks about God as the justifier. So Romans 3 is not just a, a section of a systematic theology textbook that deals with the attributes of God, and it's important to know that God is just. Those things are true. It is important to know that God is just, but the justice of God has implications that, that, uh, that, that touch you very directly. Uh, that where the rubber meets the road, where it really is going to matter to you, God's justice is first, and something follows from it. The justice of God, his, his insistence that justice be satisfied has a consequence for men. And the text is very clear. There is a very clear consequ consequence for God's justice. But it's not for all men. Only for a certain category of men. The righteousness of God, so much the focus in our text is is maintained for two reasons. First, to prove that God is just. And then second, that He justifies people. The justice of God is necessary for God to be the justifier of people. God is just. There is no other way for God to be. He, he must be just. Even the pagan recognizes justice as an essential part of life. And even though it's perverted in, in societies and so on, even though human governments can pervert justice, at root, man still recognizes justice as a central good that must be. You see it in the fiction that, that pagans produce. In the literature that pagans produce, there is always 
the, the bad guy getting his just desserts. And, and, and in a society that's starting, well, anyways, forget that. There's always justice in the heart of, 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 the, of the human condition. They, they recognize that justice must be. If you read a book where the bad guy wins, what do you do with the book? You throw it in the fireplace. Because it's, un, it's not satisfying. There's something that feels completely wrong about this, this, this lack of justice in the story. And yet God is purely righteous in his justice. The, the text uh, here specifically shows that God must be just so that he justifies. Now, God doesn't justify actions. God justifies people. And justification, as we've talked about in the past, has, has two parts, right? It has this forgiveness of sins, this pardon of the guilt of sin, and it has this counting as righteous. So there's this forgiveness, this pardon of sin, and the counting as righteousness. And all of that, it says in our larger catechism, number 70, because of the perfect obedience and full satisfaction of Christ. So God pardons, God is, uh, counts you as righteous because of perfect obedience and full satisfaction of Christ. That is the justice of God. If God is not just, he cannot justify. Now the thinking goes in two ways. Some people would say, well, well if, if God is God, why couldn't he just forget about sin and just move on? Well, what does that attack? That attacks the justice of God. It would be unjust for God to behave in such way towards those who have broken his law. That's what sin is. So he can't just forgive. He would be unjust to do so. And if he becomes unjust, then he can't justify anybody. And on the other side, you can have people who who are fearful that he will punish them for their sins, even though they have placed their faith in Christ. But again, God's justice doesn't allow that because God's justice has already been satisfied in Christ. He has already poured out his wrath on Christ. Justice is not to repunish the same offense. To be just is to punish the offense one time. And Christ's wrath has been satisfied in Christ. And so God doesn't rejudge. So God is just so he can be the justifier. But God's work of, of justifying isn't indiscriminate. His justice prevails in every circumstance, but God's justice in justifying isn't applied to everybody. He justifies, meaning that he pardons sin, he, he counts as righteous a specific group of people. Those who are joined to Christ by faith. It's not dependent on, on man's doing. We know that. Verse 20 reminds us that by the works of the law, no man is justified. So it's not by doing, it's by believing. So he justifies justly the one who believes because those have been pardoned in the blood and work of Christ. But he's also just in his condemnation. He condemns the one who presents himself to him as a keeper of the law. So God is just in condemning the unrepentant. He is just in justifying the one who comes to him by faith. He is the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ, it says uh, in, in Jesus in verse 26. For those outside of Christ, he is just in demanding an answer for all of their transgressions. He maintains his justice in the judgment of the wicked and in the justifying of those who cling to Christ by faith. For those who are in Christ, he is just in making the Son, the Redeemer, the Son, the propitiation of their sins. And for the one who rejects this Christ, he is just to ask them for an accounting of every thought, word, and deed that they have made in their entire lives and compare it to the righteous standard of his law. Both are just. 
And as God justifies those by faith, He does that as a gift. He gives it graciously. It's not man's contribution. It is the wonder of the gospel that we are redeemed, that we are, that God's wrath over our sin is satisfied in Christ, not because of anything that we have done, but, but according to his promise, those who believe are justified and he gives us that faith. See, the natural man who is without, uh, who, who is without hope lives in this life with an expectation of God's justice, his righteousness in relating to him. And the only thing that he can expect is this judgment. Because Isaiah 64 verse 6 tells us that his best works are like filthy rags. He is, uh, according to the parable found in Matthew 12, uh, 22 verse 12 and following, he is the one who presents himself in a wedding without the wedding garments. Now we live in a very casual society. But I was talking to somebody the other day, going to a, a fairly formal event, and we met in the parking lot, and this person said to me, I hope that I'm dressed appropriately. I hope I'm not, uh, I'm not the least best person in the room because you stick out like a sore thumb. Isn't that right? If you go to a black tie event and everybody's wearing a tuxedo uh, and they're in their ball gowns and you show up in, in a Hawaiian shirt and shorts and flip-flops, you're going to be fairly easily recognizable and you're going to be out of place. That is the way that God recognizes those who are not clothed in the righteousness of Christ. You look completely out of place. You're not cleansed. You're not white. Your, your garment is not white. You, have a, you, have a, you are recognizably underdressed in your spirit, so to speak. Your, your wedding garment has been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. That's the condition of the man who is without hope. There's no way of escaping notice. There's no way of, of pretending that you are a part of the redeemed. The only way that you become cleansed is through this faith in Christ. That's the only way that you have hope. And if you want to question whether or not that is an important principle in the book of Romans, follow with me to the book of Romans as it emphasizes the significance of being declared righteous because of faith. It starts in chapter 1 and verse 17 where it says that the righteous shall live by faith. In the text that we're looking together at together this morning, it talks about uh, in verse 25 that Christ's propitiation is received by faith. In verse 28 of this same chapter, it talks about the one who is justified is done is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. In verse 30 of Romans chapter 3, it says that God will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. In Romans 4 and verse 11, it talks about Abraham's circumcision as the seal of the righteousness that he had by faith. In Romans 5, when he begins that new chapter, he says, therefore, we are, since we have been justified by faith, Faith. In Romans 9 and verse 30, it talks about the Gentiles receiving a righteousness that is by faith. And in Romans 9 and verse 32, it points out how the Israelites, the Jewish people, are so ineffective in their keeping of the law because they did not pursue it by faith. This is the call of Scripture. God is just, and He justifies those who are joined to Him by faith. That is God's gracious gift. And through it, He justly justifies those who believe. They trust in His works. And that is the satisfaction for divine justice. That is the trigger. That is the mechanism that God has instituted for the salvation, the redemption of His people. So that's the... the the, the theology in this text, that God is just. He is, he is just in, his, in how he carries out his justice on man. He, because of Christ's work of redemption, Christ's work of propitiation. So because that is true, because God is just and the justifier of those who believe, we can come to him knowing that God's justice uh, is satisfied for you. Here's another way of, of saying that. The, the, the Christian is free from living before God 
as if he is under the covenant of works. The Christian doesn't live before God in the hopes that he will prove himself to God, that God will give him life. The Christian already has God's justice satisfied, and God is just so that we know there is no double jeopardy. There's no charging for the same crime again. His justice is satisfied for all his people. It's already done when he poured out his wrath on Christ and the cross. And therefore, the covenant of grace says to you, repent and believe. Repentance, a gracious gift from God. Believing, a gracious gift from God. And yet, what do we want to do? What is, what is kind of in the core of humanity? We begin knowing the gospel, trusting the gospel, relying 100% totally on the gospel, and then we turn and we pursue justice by obedience to the law. It's a hopeless exercise because we will always fail. Now, I'm not saying keeping the law is a hopeless exercise. Pursuing your approval from God by keeping the law is a hopeless exercise. Because if I bring my... Uh, self to God based on my doing, I will immediately be weighed down with doubt again. I will immediately be crushed with a lack of assurance. If I come to my relationship with God because of my doing, the only thing, the only just thing that He can do for me is to, to remove me from His presence because of my doing. If I want to present myself as, as pure before God, the only thing that God can do as a just God is to remove me because I'm not pure, because I'm, I'm polluted in my natural man. For, for the, the man and the woman who is stuck on the treadmill of accomplishment, there is this offer of rest in Christ. It's, it's his death on the cross that serves as your receipt. His blood shed is the price of your redemption. And his agony on the cross is the satisfaction of divine wrath and divine justice. There's no more need for anxious fretting when it comes to your relationship with God. If you belong to Christ by faith, Christ's work is sufficient to cover the worst of your sins. Christ's work is effective the moment you have faith in him. And so there's no more need for doubt. And then we also learn that our assurance, this removal of doubt, comes by looking to Christ's work and his sacrifice. Now, if you're like me, there are several moments that you can bring to mind from your past that immediately will make you cringe. They may not even be things that you've done. They may, not, they, they may have been things that you just thought, but as soon as that, that failure, that sin on your part comes into your mind, you just immediately become tense. You immediately begin to have regret over, over that moment. And in those moments, when our consciences are tender and our hearts are soft, sometimes we can despair, especially if the things that we think about in the past that, that have made, of, made us cringe, they come up again. They, they happen again, and, and, and we can come close to despair where we say, oh, I've done it again, and we become so ashamed because of our sins and our, our transgressions. And when we are ashamed, we fall into this destructive first impulse that we have, which is to flee from the presence of God. That's what Adam and Eve did in the garden. When they sinned and God came, they, they fled from him as their first impulse. Well, I want to give encouragement to us as we face discouragement, as we deal with the shame of our sin. God's Word tells you that God is just and that He justifies you in His justice if you have faith in Christ. That is the promise of God's Word, that the just God has satisfied the guilt of all of your, your most cringeworthy moments. He, have, he has satisfied them all in Christ. 
the sacrament of baptism is a, is a picture of that for you. It says, I belong to God by faith, and He cleanses me. Baptism isn't you taking a bath. Baptism is the cleansing waters being poured out on the filthiness of your soul, the filthiness of your heart. Baptism says, the Holy Spirit has been poured out on me. You don't go to where the water is coming from. The water comes to you. Isn't that right? Baptism is a sign that the Spirit of God rests on those who are joined to Christ by faith. You are buried with Him in His death. Picture of that. So that you will be raised with Him in life. His Word says you are forgiven. The sacrament pictures that you are forgiven. And your prayers remind you, my Father who is in heaven, your prayers remind you that you belong to Him by faith. You are a child of the Father, and He asks you, He commands you to speak with Him. You have all the rights and privileges of that child. None of them come to you by your own works. None of them come to you by your own doing. They are the fulfillment of God's promise to those who believe. Now, if you are struggling with your assurance today, your assurance will not come by doing better. Your assurance will come by resting on that promise. It will come by resting on what is pictured in God's Word, in the sacraments, and in the knowledge that you can have of God by prayer. It is by grace that you are saved, God's Word tells us. That happens by faith. It's explicit in God's Word. It is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. Uh, the Scripture is painstakingly clear that it is not a result of works because in salvation, nobody can boast. Because by nature, who are we? We are the unrighteous person of Romans 3, verse 10 and 18. And we come into the presence of the righteous God, not by what we have done, but because of the redemption and propitiation that Christ has purchased, uh, has accomplished for us. The text uh, before us here today proves the righteousness of God in, in, the, in situations of justice. God not ultimately passing over sin, but redeeming the sinner through Christ's blood. Divine justice is announced as satisfied. And because that is so, God is just to justify those who believe. He pardons sin and He accepts as righteous those who have faith in Christ. That is the way the righteousness of God is justly transferred to man. And it gives you freedom from striving to please God. I'm not saying it gives you freedom from living obediently to God. That's a different, different subject for a different time. I'm talking about ceasing from striving to please God. He is already pleased with you if you are in Christ. Not because of what you have done, but because of His works, because of His sacrifice on your behalf. So, my fellow struggling Christian, be comforted. Your righteousness before God is just, and it is firmly established by the redemption of Christ, His work of propitiation, and He gives it to you by working faith in you. Let's pray together.